Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Sam Roberts is my idea of what a newspaper person should be, knowledgeable, inquisitive, and understandable. He's been a reporter, columnist, and editor at the New York Times since 1982 and hosts the nightly television interview show New York Close-Up. He can take a large topic and find a way to illustrate clearly what it's all about. He's done that in his new book, who We Are Now, A Statistical Portrait of the American People. Welcome. As, uh, glad to see you again. Thank you, Ronnie. Pleasure so, to be here. You did a book like this 10 years ago. I did a book 10 years ago called Who We Are, and frankly, I That's thought I would leave it just at that. But so much has changed in the past 10 years that I decided it was time to go back and look at how America has changed and who we are now. now. It's done every 10 years because it follows the census. Right. It is and done. Uh, the census is taken every 10 years under the Constitution, cons right. mostly to apportion the House of Representatives. But of course, we use that data for lots of other reasons. From the old days when the Senate wasn't wasn't uh, in relationship to the population, right? Isn't it? Well, and the House, uh, the too, House. in terms of the yeah. states. And right. in fact, this last census in 2000, oh, right. the, as a result the of the you know, inexorable move of people west and south, uh, the Northeast lost more congressional representation. That's another reason we're not being paid uh, much attention in this presidential campaign. Yeah. And the South and West each picked up five seats in Congress. So what's happened in the last 10 years? Well, what's happened, if, I think you could sum it up in three categories. We have gotten older, uh, we've gotten darker, and we have gotten more diverse in terms of families. Older first, uh, baby boomers are now on the verge of retirement. The first baby boomers will approach official retirement age, at least in 2011. So baby boomers were born in what? Roughly 1945, 46 to about 1960 or so. And uh, that's why the median age in the country is now higher than it's ever been. It's about 36. Uh, just think, uh, only about 100 years ago, it was 26. A uh, relatively uh, short time. It's amazing. It, really it is amazing. Is really and of course, amazing. lifespans have increased enormously. Someone born in 1900 would not, on average, live to see the middle of the century. Someone born now, on average, will come close to uh, living to see century. the next century. Uh, so we're getting older, we're getting darker, uh, you can say. The complexion of the country is, is changing. More and more Hispanic people, more and more Asian people coming in, mostly through immigration, also because of higher fertility rates among immigrants and newcomers. And at the rate we're going uh, right now, there are the 1990s brought in more foreign-born people numerically than ever before. Uh, we're not quite at the past the percentage of the 1930s, but numerically we're at a high. And it's fascinating because one out of every five Americans is now either foreign-born or the children of foreign-born. Of course, in New York City, the number even higher, the foreign-born population in New York is probably somewhere between 36, 37, even close to 40 percent. And the third category, the diversity of the family, when you look back uh, to 1990 even, you look back certainly to 1950, most families were that nuclear family, as we called it, the, the mother who stayed home as a housewife, the father went out and worked, and probably two kids. That now accounts for about 7% of all households in That's the country. That's amazing, isn't and it? And one of the reasons, again, people are getting married later, so they're living alone. Right. They're uh, living longer, so there are more, for the most part, widows uh, living alone right. at the other end. We now have more people living alone, more uh, households composed of people living alone than we have of married couples. We have a majority of families in which there are two parent families in which both parents now work. And we have more marriages that are ending in divorce than in death, uh, which is rather remarkable. I interviewed Calvin Butts of Abyssinian Baptist Church not long ago, and he was saying that some uh, prospective uh, couples were coming to him and saying, do we have to say till death do us part in the marriage vows? Uh, they said, come on, that's not realistic. How about something like, as long as our love shall last? <laughs> and he said, basically, find another minister. But statistically, they're right. There are now more marriages, uh, new marriages ending in divorce than in death. So do we say that, that one out of two marriages now 
new marriages end in divorce? That is about right. Uh, those statistics are a little hard to come by because you could never, there's no linear way for the most part of tracing a marriage from Where beginning to yeah. end. Uh, but based on the statistics, that is probably true. In 1900, again, there were one in 100 Americans who were divorced. There are now about one in 10 who were divorced. It's just uh, the differences. But So what are the things that have... The, uh, I, I was particularly struck with the figure that there are more people in prison than there are in college? Well, more people living in prison or, or the prison system than in college dormitories, and that's oh, one that's... of those alarming statistics. Uh, uh, again, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean there are more people in prison than in college because some oh, people see. go it's to college and, and to, not in to... dorms. Uh, so we have to be really careful when we look at all this to be information. Very careful looking at Does statistics. Does the information all come from census tracts? Most of it is from census tracts. From the and long the long forms, not the short forms. That's right. The long forms, which are very detailed, and then you can extrapolate from that. Uh, I did it in large part with the help of uh, Andy Beveridge at Queens College and also Andrew Hacker at Queens College, both of whom were very helpful in this. But you've got to be careful with numbers. Uh, in the book, when I talk about predictions, uh, I point out that according to one sociologist, right. facetiously, he says the way Hasidic Jews are multiplying in Brooklyn and the way Mormons are multiplying in Utah, somewhere around the middle of the century, they're going to meet in Indiana. Well, in <laughs> fact, not likely, but you can get too much out of statistics, too. Who makes, up the, who makes up the questions? Let's go back to the very basic things so that we know how we get what we do with all this information. Who makes up the basic questions that go on the long form? It's a good question. It's very complicated because lots of sociologists, demographers, economists want to throw more and more questions on. And of course, given the amount of time that people would ever spend filling out the form, they try and keep it relatively simple. And not everybody gets the long form. I forget what percentage of people it's, do, something like maybe one in 10 yeah, or, or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of it is set, believe it or not, by the Commerce Department, where the Census Bureau is, and also by the Office of Management and Budget in Washington, which cooks up lots of those categories, decides racial uh, categories for the first time in the 2000 census. People were allowed to say they were of more than one race, and a fair number of people did. Uh, and that's, you know, it makes it more difficult sometimes to compare the data from one census to another because they're not always mirror Same. images. Uh, but someone once compared it to weighing yourself on a faulty scale. You may not know the exact weight, but you know if you're going up or down yeah. at least. So the questions are fed in over a long period of time, I would assume. It takes years to prepare the census, It takes right? years to prepare. They are certainly so they're working well now. on their way to working on the 2010 census. Yeah. That one will probably be more technologically advanced than any we've seen so far. People will have uh, like handheld uh, uh, computers, yeah. uh, people probably will be able to respond by email, uh, lots of things like that. And you have to remember again to take the numbers at some, you know, with a grain of salt. They are not precise uh, and they are constantly changing. In 2000, the census on April 1st, like a snapshot of the country, counted 281 million people. Well, we're growing at the rate now of about 10 people every minute. Um, in this country. Uh, and obviously, you know, that's factoring births, deaths, and immigration. Uh, so we're now closer to maybe 295 million, almost 300 we're million. we're growing at such a rapid rate. And we're growing at a rapid rate. Uh, more than any other industrialized country in the world. And again, a large part of that that distinguishes us from Asia or Japan, the developed countries of Asia, and from Western Europe, again, immigration. We are gaining people and gaining people who are coming and also having children. Where are we gaining most people from? Latin America. Uh, if you look at where uh, foreigners, foreign-born people come from, now about 51 percent are from Latin America. And it's interesting because when you look at ancestry in this country, not that much has changed in terms of individual countries. Uh, you can still find out that Germany is still probably the leading country of ancestry. Germany, Ireland, Italy, England, uh, the countries of Eastern mm -hmm. Europe to some extent. Uh, but now in terms of foreign-born people, uh, Latin America is number one, uh, mostly Mexico, if you look at the entire United States, if not the New York area in particular, uh, and then Asia as well. Europe is, plays a very, very small role in that immigration. And Africa? Africa, for the first time, we are seeing people Some, yeah. in substantial numbers come voluntarily, right. uh, which is very interesting. Uh, you're also seeing movements uh, that sort of defy 
uh, predictions that might have been made uh, years ago. You see blacks now migrating to the south again, uh, in part where their roots are, are where families are. They're basically are. African Americans. That are they are definitely African Americans, right. not Africans coming to right. America. Right. Uh, but you see them migrating to the south, and part of that is, is again, the familial connection. Part of that, uh, like with any migration, is where the jobs are. Right. And a lot of them are, as we age older, that's right, they go back down there. But what, what are we, the, 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 Latin, the Latin population is going to, is far, it exceeds the black population. Well, that's another thing that I it's point out in the book, faster. that for the first time, the Hispanic or Latino population has surpassed the black population, both in many individual cities like New York and also nationwide. And that has profound implications politically, culturally, uh, probably economically. Uh, Smith is still the most common surname in this country, but if you look at the 50 or so most common surnames, there are now, I think, 10 Hispanic names, Gonzalez, Garcia, Rodriguez, uh, Hernandez, who among uh, uh, those names. <laughs> in Texas, the number one name among newborns is Jose, among newborn bo boys. Uh, it's number two in Arizona, it's number three in California. In California, for the first time, uh, among newborns, a majority are Hispanic. Now, one thing that's fascinating about th that to me, and one of the reasons I wrote the book, is it's not for the first time ever. It's for the first time since the 1850s. So when people think of this country becoming less Anglo-Saxon, changing, in fact, we've always been changing. We're going through an evolution uh, that, has, that began well before white, Anglo-Saxons came here and will go on The only people who were native, if they were native, were the Native Americans. And they right. came from Asia or right. wherever and it was. So it's all, That's it's right. a totally evolving thing. It's also funny that... More so than a lot of, than the European countries and Scandinavian countries or not? More so... More evolving with the Absolutely. population. Yeah. Most of those countries have always been reluctant yeah. to allow immigrants. Now some of them are having to, even Japan, right. to replenish their workforces because the population is aging so much. But one thing that's interesting, when you look at those names in New York City, and it's a sign, I think, of, of assimilation, and you can make your own judgment about how good, bad, whatever. In New York City, the number one name among Hispanic newborns is, I believe, Michelle for girls and Justin for boys. <laughs> Uh, and so if that doesn't now, show m melding in right? exactly if that doesn't so show the melting pot continuing right um, where do they where what what happened to where we live now is there a big change in that well part Maybe of it, since 1950 more than 1990 well definitely uh, we, in the past 50 years again that population has kept shifting west and south uh, the the demographers have this statistic that that only a statistician could love if everyone weighed exactly the same where would the united states pivot <laughs> yeah, you know right. where would it be and it turns out to be a place in missouri and that again that point that center of population point keeps moving every 10 years farther west and farther south as those areas gain in population one thing that happened this time, part of it was better counting, part of it better efforts by the city itself. New York topped Increased. 8 million people. Yeah. Uh, now one in 13 Americans lives in the New York metropolitan area, which is incredible. Uh, we right. may not think of uh, ourselves politically sometimes and maybe even culturally as being that numerous, but one in 13 of all the people in the United States live in metropolitan New York. And then there are breakdowns that in which our influence or our role is even greater. If you look at mass transit riders, one in three of the people who ride mass transit live in New York City. Now, most of the people in the country, though, live in metropolitan areas. That is absolutely right. Uh, if you look at the average American, which, again, is this statistical average, in 1900, it was a 26-year-old man. Uh, he lived in a rural area, probably in the eastern United States. Uh, if you look in 1950, it was a woman, probably around 30 or so, 31. She was married, probably worked in the home as a housewife, which we would have called her at the time. Uh, and if you look in the year 2000, it is a woman, again, married, working outside the home, living in a metropolitan area, probably owns her own home, uh, and um, uh, is probably around 36 years old. And living in a metropolitan area means including the suburbs. So 
more people live in the suburbs than they do in central cities. Absolutely. In fact, one thing that another reason I, I redid this book is uh, because by 2000, the majority of people were living in the suburbs, that the percentage living in central cities, metropolitan area composed of cities and suburbs, the proportion living in the central cities actually went down so, in the so Those of us living in New York City know they're missing a lot when they move to the suburbs. Absolutely, all we right. sure do. <laughs> so what are the implications from all of this? First of all, let, tell me, were you always good at statistics? No, never, <laughs> never. So uh, how did you get into Not you know, easily. You just, you, this comes rolling out, and it's, uh, it's, the book is so interesting, but it's, it's, and it's a lot of numbers. So it's a it's typical not journalist story that I'm sure you can identify with. I was overdue on another book 10 years ago, and I was telling my editors at Times Books then, I'm working on all these great census stories, and they're really fascinating, and I'm writing them for the Times, and they <laughs> said, oversell. sounds like a book. <laughs> so I did that book, and then uh, they said, why don't you just update the book on the basis of the 2000 so census? So what are the implications? And it turned out there was so much new. Of that, this. What, well, what do the, we think about now? What, where, where are we as a country? Well. I mean, we're changing. We're changing. We're the very color different is changing. from the age is changing. We're very different from any country the rest of the world. And it was interesting because Condoleezza Rice, when she testified before the 9/11 Commission, said they attacked us because of who we are. Well, in fact, I don't think they know who we are. We right. barely know who right. we are. And we are this country that is just unique in the world. We're composed of more foreigners than any other country, more diversity in every aspect of our being. And the big challenge of this next century and frankly in this election campaign is how we manage that diversity, how we keep from cleaving into a society of kind of older, whiter voters who are concerned about issues of health care and social security and the like and a younger darker population that is, of course, concerned about health care, but lots of other issues, too, whether it's mass transit or education and things like I went that. To, we went to a Croatian wedding over the weekend, and it was all done in, Croa in Croatian. I mean, and then the party afterwards, a very large dinner afterwards, and the dancing was to Croatian music, and the speaking was in Croatian, and they they have the Croatian national anthem, although they played the 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 United, our national anthem, the stars, star, uh, whatever it is, Star Spangled Band. But I was struck with that coherence and that sense of that country that's so different from my understanding of this country because we are embracing so many different cultures that we don't have our own really American culture, do we? Well, but our American cu culture is it's a combination, from everybody's. a conglomeration of all of that. If you look back... But uh, you uh, also said this isn't really a melting pot, it, pot, it's more a mosaic. Well, to some extent that's true, but uh, I think you can find pieces, chips of that mosaic in, in all of us, whether yeah. it's language, whether it's culture, whether so. it's what we eat. Uh, it's just so fascinating. So you think we're richer because we have more cultures I think contributing than... Absolutely. Some, yeah. We are richer uh, culturally, uh, right. richer spiritually. It also means we sometimes have trouble getting along. But in spite of this, we get along remarkably well. Right. There are, is, is, do you, can you see from the figures whether there's the split in the country that, that political uh, commentators say there is? or that the figures from the polls show there is? You can't really, can Well, you? it's hard from these figures, but you can look at splits in terms of the regions of the country, certainly their agendas, their populations, uh, where people are older and where they're younger, where they're more likely to be black or Hispanic, more likely to be white, uh, more likely uh, to be richer or poorer. There but are it's still interesting vast differences if, the, if there's an increase in black migration to the south, that's going to change the southern politics. It has to, doesn't it? Absolutely, it does. And one of the things we're seeing, again, in the past 10 years that I think we didn't see as much before, in terms of immigration and also in terms of mobility in this country, you see more diversity in people coming in and more diversity in where they're going. Uh, you see the Pakistani news dealers in Idaho. You see Indian uh, delis in Iowa. Uh, things like that have spread not in, in shocking, soaring numbers, but enough numbers uh, so there's much more dispersal, much more uh, uh, diversity than there's so ever there's been before. So be there are going to be political ramifications from this. No question. There are going to be political ramifications in part because Hispanics are becoming a much more major voting bloc. Not yet, because a lot of them aren't necessarily citizens, right. but they will be. Asians, we're right. seeing that in New York and elsewhere too. 
uh, and that has profound implications. Now, but also the census is very important, not only for the apportionment of the House, but for a lot of the legislation and budget items that come across. So um, as we age, as you said before, it's going to increase. I mean, the demand for health care is going to increase. For housing, certainly, because there needs to be new specialized, more specialized housing. What were the figures? Do you remember about nursing homes? I don't remember the exact population. Surprisingly low, in fact, given the number yeah. of people who claim some that sort of disabilities. Living, yeah. uh, people rather live at home if they can, right. as long as they can. Right. And that's another reason you're seeing uh, more people over the age of 85 leaving Florida than coming into Florida. These are probably people who retired there, played their golf, did whatever one does in Florida, uh, and now coming back to, to live family. with their children, live with their grandchildren uh, as best they can. So Florida has a younger population than we think it does. Well, it doesn't have as old a population as we, <laughs> as we think, think it does. does. It's right. still the oldest population uh, percentage-wise in the country, uh, but it's only, not only, it's about 17 percent now that's over the age of 65. Now, and how many people have, I mean, we, we hear about these uh, large numbers of people who have registered to vote. Is that reflective of the aging of the of the age in, in the census, or is it a reflection of the activity to get people to vote? I think it's the activity to get people yeah. to vote. I think uh, if you look generally and historically, and you know this I'm sure better than I do, older people tend to vote more often, more frequently, more regularly. Uh, younger people, even when they got the right to vote, do not. Yeah, yeah. I think more and more of those people are now being registered. And I also think, interestingly enough, the polls for better or for worse, depending on which side you're on, are not capturing that. Uh, just one technological reason, I think, is cell phones. Uh, they're, they're not being polled. Uh, right. and, and how you know, many cell phones are there? 100 million yeah. cell phones in the country, yeah. some absolutely and incredible number. And for some number. of those people, they're the only phones. Exactly. And I think that that is more likely to be younger, perhaps more affluent people uh, who may this time go out and vote. Yeah. Um, what other political implications can you get from this? Well, I think, uh, again, apart from the actual apportionment of, of the House, uh, which the census right. is based on, which is based on the census, uh, you can see a country that, because of aging, you run the risk of that cleavage between an older group that has one agenda and a younger group that doesn't. You have a question, economists call it the dependency ratio. The number of people oh, of working the age. <laughs> well, the number of people of working age versus the number of people who are too young to work, or and the number old. of people who are too old or have retired. Someone's got to support those younger and older people. They have to be enough in the middle, or you've got to do things like change the retirement age, uh, increase taxes, let more immigrants in, uh, and these are all decisions that are going to be made on the national level and directly as a result of the changing demographics of the country. And the agendas, the political agendas should also, I mean, that's what we're talking about. But when you think about the, the strength of the farm, farm block in the Congress, um, it doesn't reflect the increase in population. It now reflects more big business. Well, that's right. It's not the, the small farmers. Right. It's, it's the agribusiness companies right. that are making all the money and also making the campaign contributions. Yeah. So, um, you, I mean, what do you think is going to happen in the next 10 years? if you follow along and Well, again, you don't want to extrapolate too much, but I think we will get a bit older, not as much as we might if it weren't for immigration. The median uh, age will probably rise another couple of years and I think stay under 40. Uh, we will increase immigration and given the birth rates, uh, I'd say by about 2030 or so, the rate we're going now, a majority of Americans under the age of 18 will be what the census calls non-Hispanic whites. Uh, we will have that giant bulge of older people moving through the population, again retiring starting in about 2011. And I think we'll have increasing diversity in the family, uh, more tolerant regulation and laws, more tolerant benefits, uh, and people uh, deciding more what to do for themselves, not necessarily on the basis of traditions. Most people still get married. Uh, with all of these numbers and everything else, but it's clear they're getting married later. And they're fewer having fewer children, children, and uh, some of them not having children and at all. And what is life expectancy now? Enormous. Uh, it is <laughs> astounding. Again, in 1900, you wouldn't have lived on average to see the middle of the century. Now it's somewhere 80 or so for most people on average, if you were born uh, in 2004. 
And if you were born sometime in the century, it still goes up. Yes. Once you've made it this far, your chances of staying yeah, alive right, are, are, are even better. better. Right. Thank goodness. That's a help. Um, so I, we're coming to the end of the interview. We haven't even discussed the elections or what we think. But do you think that this, uh, the revealing portrait that you have from the census is any kind of way of analyzing what the results are going to be? Well, I think a little bit. I mean, again, you don't know exactly who's going to vote. And a lot of the people in the book are newcomers to the country who aren't yet registered to vote. Uh, but I think what you see is a very dynamic situation, a very diverse situation. And I think anyone who makes solid predictions on the basis Based of on past the polls experience. and past experience is missing the boat. Especially unlikely voters, and, that, and that's, of course, one of the basis of the polls, Exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, Sam Roberts, uh, thank you very much. Are you, do you have a new book you're starting? Uh, not yet. All thinking right. of several. You're thinking of several. All right. Thank you. This is a fascinating book. Uh, who we are now. Soon maybe you'll tell us where we are in life or something else. I don't know what, but thank you very much. Thanks for having thank me. Thank you.